with me is the author Woody Ihimara. Ich darf Sie recht herzlich äh, begrüßen zu dieser kleinen Runde. Ähm, das Gespräch und die Lesungen werden simultan übersetzt. Äh, so, falls Sie den weiteren Verlauf auf Deutsch per Kopfhörer verfolgen möchten, äh, können Sie das gerne tun. In der Rangatir Martina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Tato Katoa, Community Honore, Go Homa Kio, Kite Kite Tu, Itene Kitene Fenua, or Goethe, or Schiller, or Thomas Mann, or Mala, Elma Mala, Anna Mala, Krenek, Koto Katoa, Nadeda, Tina Koto, Tina Koto, Tina Tato Katoa. In the old days, in the years that have gone before us, the land and sea felt a great emptiness, a yearning. The mountains were like a stairway to heaven and the lush green rainforest was a rippling cloak of many colours. The sky was iridescent, swirling with the patterns of wind and clouds. Sometimes it reflected the prisms of rainbow or southern aurora. The sea was ever-changing, shimmering and seamless to the sky. This was the well at the bottom of the world, and when you looked into it, you felt you could see to the end of forever. The land was virginal. It was waiting, waiting for the seeding, waiting for the gifting, waiting for the blessing to come. The sun rose and set, rose and set. Then one day at its noon apex, the first sight sighting was made. A spume on the horizon, a dark shape rising from the greenstone depths of the ocean, awesome leviathan breaching through the surface and hurling itself skyward before falling seaward again. And underwater, the muted thunder boomed like a great door opening far away, and both sea and land trembled from the impact of that downward plunging. And suddenly, suddenly, the sea was filled with awesome singing, a song with eternity in it, a song to the land. Karanga mai, karanga mai, karanga mai, karanga mai e te whenua nei ki a hau te kai e ke tohora karanga mai. The dark shape rising, rising, it was a whale gigantic, a sea monster, just as it burst through the sea, A flying fish, leaping high in its ecstasy, saw water and air streaming like thundering foam from that noble beast and knew, ah, yes, the time had come. There was the whale and there was the man riding the whale and the sacred sign was on the whale, a swirling moko pattern imprinted on the forehead. And the man saw far off the land long sought and now found Aotearoa, And with great gladness and thanksgiving, he, the man, cried out to the land again. Karanga mai, karanga mai, karanga mai, karanga mai nei e te whenua nei ki a hau te kai e ke tohora, karanga mai. The flukes of the whale stroked majestically at the sky. Huie, homie, taikie. Thank you. Thank you for that, Woody. And we've just heard an extract from Woody's 1987 novel, The Whale Rider. Those of you who have had a chance to look at the multimedia presentation here will also have seen images of a girl riding on the back of a whale, which is from the 2002 uh, German-New Zealand co-production, the film adaptation of, of this novel. Perhaps We were very, very honoured to get that money from Germany because without it, we would not have been able to make the movie. It took 12 years to obtain that movie, uh, to obtain that money. Mm. And uh, so the quality, the technical quality of the film is, of course, due mm. to the technical excellence of German filmmaking. Okay. It, 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 why is it that it took so long for the film to come out? Uh, well, you know, in New Zealand, the film industry is not that very big. And uh, 
we were making a film that we were attempting to uh, create for a New Zealand audience. I don't know if John Barnett, the producer, is in the audience today, but John Barnett was the executive producer of the film, and uh, without him, the film would not have been made. He held on to onto the project so tightly, and uh, we were as surprised as everybody else when it broke out and became an international success. It was made for New Zealand uh, $3 million, which is not a, m a lot of money in euro. Mm, and all of my aunties and uncles were in it, by the way. <laughs> when we went on the set for the first uh, day, I was so worried because we wanted them to appear as they were in normal life. And uh, some of my aunties had put on high heels and they had just been to the, just been to the, the beauty shop. And the houses had suddenly sprung rose bushes around them. So we had to ask them, I had to say to my auntie Tilly, oh, auntie, please, you know, I want you to look the way you really look in real life. Mm. So that when the film was, uh, w when they saw the film, they were so angry with me because they didn't look as beautiful as, uh, you know, a Hollywood movie star. <laughs> but it was one of those movies uh, that, uh, as I say, surprised us. Um, because of it, um, someone thought I knew a lot about Wales, so they decided... Um, they, could, they started to call me the Prince of Wales. <laughs> and then I was put on a, um, a, a commission, which was a research um, commission for, for whaling in the Pacific. But we're so proud because when uh, the young um, actress, Keisha Castle-Hughes, uh, became the, um, the youngest um, nominee for the, um, the Academy Awards, when she went down that red carpet, she became Moby Chick. <laughs> very cute. And um, the passage that you've just read tells the story of an ancestor of yours, Paikea, as he migrates to New Zealand on the back of a whale. Can you tell us a little bit more about Paikea? And uh, he is the, um, the originating ancestor of my mother's people, the people from Ngati Paro, and they are a people who live on the east coast of the North Island. Um, and um, in all of my, my work, I try to put myth first. Um, as much as I enjoy the fact that Sir Peter Jackson has made the Lord of the Rings in New Zealand and turned New Zealand into Middle Earth, uh, my function is, of course, not to create a Middle Earth in New Zealand, but to create a Māori Earth. Right, OK. And I, I learnt this morning that for the purposes of uh, navigation in the old times, that the migration, the seasonal migration of whales was an important navigational aid for early Polynesian uh, navigators. Um, do you think there is some reality to the myth of riding on the back of a whale to New Zealand? Well, ab absolutely. It is a real myth. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a real happening. So, therefore, I do believe that whales, the language that uh, whales speak is Māori. Right. Okay. Um, but apart from anything else, uh, you know, I I've used it for a metaphor in my own career um, that uh, whenever I have always, you know, begun a new piece of work, I will ask Paikea, my ancestor, to help me as I navigate those very, very treacherous waters um, of creating narrative because for Māori, those of you who have been here, you will have seen the performances by the brilliant um, Te Ope Orehua. For Māori, that is the kind of literary and artistic um, event um, that they prefer. Writing novels is a very, very solitary thing and, um, in fact, uh, the novel is an alien construct for um, indigenous peoples, is my belief. Yeah. So I was just going to raise that. The, the novel talks about Pākehā as an ancestor who appears as a tekutoko at the top of the uh, Farinui, at the top of, uh, as a carving at the top of the meeting house. Um, perhaps you can say something about the other narrative Māori forms that we've seen also at the book fair here, carving and, and your, how you see literature as relating to those other narrative forms. Well, there is no difference between a moko, which tells a story, um, a, a short story, which also tells a story, a carving. Some of you might have gone down to the, uh, the, the, the carving um, exhibit um, in the uh, Agora. Um, for us, they're all, all telling stories, and I think this is why the land is so important to Māori, because uh, the land itself is a living history book. It's a ge geographical text. It's, uh, uh, the sky is a celestial text. And the sea also is a, a marine text. So um, Māori learnt very, very early how to read uh, those texts, how to read by backside in terms of navigation across the sea by canoe. Mm. And, of course, um, 
they would also uh, navigate by the stars. So as a writer, I navigate the same way. Right. Okay. I navigate according to a Māori universe, a universe that, um, th th that involves uh, the sky, involves the, um, the earth, and involves the sea within my psychic spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, my father, however, on a more practical matter, he would say to me things like, because I was hopeless physically, finding my way from one place to another, and he would say, you call yourself a Māori, you can't even get from one side of the street to another even when the stars are out. <laughs> it's very nice, yeah. So I'm, I, I, I became very, very good at navigating my way through the European Western text of fiction, but not so good um, in, practical, in the practical way. Right, OK. <laughs> and as we heard quite impressively in the reading that you've just done, the, the karanga, the, the calling, the, the sungness of Māori speech is also an important aspect to your literature. Do you want to say something about the musicality in language and its importance in your work? Well, it was always difficult when I began to actually um, create a different space for um, Māori text because, of course, um, the Māori uh, written tradition in English is, is, is very, very short. Uh, the first Māori um, men and women who began to write fiction and poetry only appeared in the 1950s. So we are a um, we're a um, uh, a group of, of artists and artisans uh, of only 62 years standing, mm. and yet um, we've managed somehow to uh, you know to have wonderful writers like Kerry Hume, who won the Booker Prize, yes. and um, Patricia Grace, who won a an Indigenous Prize, actually um, here in Germany. Alan Duff, of course, his wonderful book One for Warriors and film. But really, there are only five practicing Māori novelists, and it's a very, very difficult position for us. It's an isolated position. Hmm. So um, one of the things that we need, needed to do in the beginning was to say to ourselves, theoretically, we don't want to write the same kind of a book as a, a Western European writer in New Zealand would write. So how do you begin to navigate your way through that world and yet provide enough convincing technical abilities based on Māori ideologies and Māori theoretical, um, um, and, uh, Māori theoretical backgrounds to write a book which is more akin to the spiral, which is, allows us to go into a story and comes out, that has history um, to the forefront, that has what we call ihi, which is energy, that has what we call purpose, which is kopapa, and that has what we call uh, um, how, which is mahi, so every time I start a new book, I'm always trying to operate from a, a Māori centre and then go out from it. And in fact, just at the background now, is uh, they're playing The Whale Rider. Um, that's, that's the song, isn't it? Yes, yeah, that's the, the song end, on yes. The Whale Rider. Yes. yes, okay, fantastic. But apart from that too, I mean, I've learned a lot from um, many, many sources. And uh, really, I'm grateful to be here in, in Germany because um, I'm, I love Mahler. Mm. I think that Mala is probably, you know, the most um, um, universal. The, the, the language of music is so universal. So as soon as I, you know, I hear Das Lied von der Erde, which is the song of the earth, I, const I, I, I immediately go back to New Zealand. <laughs> and, uh, of course, um, I am also... Uh, uh, F.W. Murnau, his movie, uh, his yes. silent movie. yes. Um, what's it called? Uh, F. W. Murnau's um, wonderful, wonderful movie. The name escapes me. But mm. you know, all no, of these people. Nosferatu. No, no. Nosferatu. Mm. Yes, Nosferatu. Uh, and so, there are the, all of these other mm. other influences in the work. And one of them, um, I actually uh, used for the template for my latest novel, The Parihaka Woman, mm. because I think that Beethoven's um, The Dalio is one of the great works of art. Yes, OK. We're just going to come to that. So this is uh, your most recent novel, and we've got a bit of a waterfall behind us here, but we'll bear with it. Um, your latest novel from 2011, The Parihaka Woman, tells the story of an episode in New Zealand history that is, is shameful and not often remembered. Would you like to tell us something about the episode at Parihaka and why you decided to write about it? 
Yes, well, normally my work is about my own valley, which is the valley of the Waituhi in, on the east coast. But the Parihaka woman has, has mm. normally been told only through a, a Pākehā framework. So I wanted to create um, the, the, the story of Parihaka, but through Māori eyes and through a, a Māori perspective. At the same time, uh, I had uh, originally um, tried to create an opera called Erenora based on on Beethoven's Fidelio, and I thought that what I could do is to um, use the story of a, a, a young woman in the Beethoven opera, her name is Leonor. Uh, in the book, her name is Erenora, which is the Māori transliteration. In the opera, um, the name of her husband is uh, Florestan, and in uh, the novel, it's Horitana. And of course, Pizarro, who's the villain, is now Piharo in the book. So. Um, I, I, I wanted to attach to that frame of a faithful wife looking for her husband who had been imprisoned after the downfall of Parihaka, which was surrounded by uh, um, British soldiers and, as you say, a very, very shameful uh, part of New Zealand's um, history. And, uh, bec uh, as I said, uh, there's a, the, the, um, the kainga of Parihaka was completely decimated men were um, sent away to exile in the South Island, and the crux of the story of the Parihaka woman is how um, Erenora, the faithful wife, goes looking for her husband. Okay. Yeah, so this, this was, as you say, a, a peaceful settlement just west yes. of Taranaki, and uh, it was probably yes. New Zealand's first example well, of non-violent resistance. Some people don't realise that at one stage in New Zealand there were more British soldiers in New Zealand than in any other country in the world. And I think that that attests to the vigour and the aggression of Māori people in attempting to make sure that they held on to their land. Hmm. OK. Um, as, you, as you mentioned, the, and I think as Hazel Rizabra says in her book, The Days of Darkness, which is one primary uh, study of, of, of the Parihaka events, uh, she notes that there was quite a lot of interest in this at the time, around 1881, in the newspapers but the subsequently academic historiography let the topic go. It disappeared out of national histories. You're lucky if you get a yes. footnote, a lapidary paragraph here and there. Yes, um, you are very, very lucky. For instance, um, the name of Parihaka was expunged from all of the, right. the historical atlases, and it was replaced by New another name. Yes. That's right. Yes. So, uh, so it, it has been a really exciting opportunity for me to rewrite that story, but mm. from a Māori perspective, right. and to put Māori history first. Hmm. And to what extent do you see your work as contesting a kind of historical or cultural amnesia in New Zealand about the darker sides of our past? Uh, any Indigenous writer is in a contestatory position. You know, you, you obviously take a default position. You are writing against the primary text. And, of course, the primary text in New Zealand was, until the 1950s, um, a Pākehā or European text. Hmm. So one of the dilemmas, of course, for Māori writers is not only to maintain a Māori um, uh, position of sovereignty, but also try to convince New Zealand that we are doing this for the benefit of the country, mm. that if you are unable to uh, look at your past and then find solutions to it, uh, then you can never really have any, any kind of transcendence or transformation. So um, although... Um, the Parihaka woman has had really terrible reviews in New Zealand because of its politics. At the same time, I, you know, I still must keep those parameters as, as wide apart as possible so that the middle ground is large enough for uh, people in New Zealand to find for themselves uh, what the centrality of our position should be as we go into the future. Mm. Okay. Maybe I can read something from... The well, woman. why don't we do that? Yes, okay. okay. We'll hear something from the Parihaka woman, as mentioned uh, with his latest novel from 2011, published by Vintage. I'm getting so old now, you know, I need glasses as well. In the aftermath of Parihaka's destruction, my sisters Ripeka, Mary and I thought constantly of our husbands. 
By now, two years had passed since they had been marched away from New Plymouth for taking their ploughs onto the settlers' land. Since then, other men had also been submitted to imprisonment without trial. When, in acts of passive resistance, they rebuilt fences Mr. Bryce had torn down in the building of his road to carry his constabulary in the taking of our kainga. Oh, the grand old Duke of York, he had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill. And when our two prophets, our beloved leaders, Te Fiti Orongomai and Tohu Kākahi, were shackled and led away, well, that too was a black day. Only a few stalwart men, women, children still remained in the kainga. Piharo, Bryce's settler lieutenant, knew he was still there, holding on, and he was still harassing me, wishing to enslave me. He liked to ride to Parihaka to hunt me out with the express purpose of tempting me as I scrabbled with my sisters for food. Are you not hungry yet, Erinora? I have a place already set for you at my table. Will you not join me one evening? Bedeviled by him, I sought escape by going down to the sea, and it was there that I had a matakite, a vision about my husband. At least I thought it was Horitana, except that all I could see was a moko mokai. It was a tattooed mask, the moko of it plated with silver, and the mask was shining with silver. It was such a beautiful yet sinister object to look upon that I was filled both with awe and dread. And then, as I was looking at it, the face began to sing. But the voice, the voice was that of my husband, Horitana. How could that be? And his song was full of pain and agony. God, welk dunkel here. O we e atua, kua ngaro aho i te po. How dark it is in this moko mokai. O we hoki te pori o tene ao. How terrible this mask, how terrible this silence. I did not understand the vision, but although my soul was filled with foreboding, I felt hope dawning and voiced the thought that came to me. My husband, Horitana, is still alive. If he had been dead, his spirit would have visited me to tell me he was waiting for me in Terenga. But why was he in so much pain? His agony was so intense that I put my hands to my head, moaning, and I cried out to Horitana, O oh, valiant heart, practice the art of forbearance. But even when the vision ended, I could not rid my memory of that tragic voice coming from the silver face of the mask and the agony that inflicted it. What had happened to him? That was when my decision came upon me. It mounted in me, my resolve rising. Although I would have to leave my sisters to fend for themselves, I would go and look for him. What else could I do? He was my husband. I was his wife. Ka patu patu taku manoa. Ka patu patu. Ka patu patu. Ka patu patu taku manawa. My heart was beating so. With faithful heart, Erinora began her quest to find Horitana. She would travel from Taranaki, find passage across Cook Strait, and try to find him on the other side in the South Island. But how could she, a Māori woman, be able to travel through a dangerous and hostile land? One evening... Her glance happened to light upon a book of Shakespeare's plays given to her by a kind visitor to Parihaka in Twelfth Night. She recalled the heroine Viola is wrecked on the coast of Illyria and must masquerade as a man to survive in a hostile land. That made Erinora remember something else. She had heard from the traditions of another tribe on the east coast, which told that when their first settlers had just landed, the men went to investigate the strange new country, but the women waited in the waka, However, the tide came up and the canoe started to drift towards the rocks. By tradition, women were forbidden to be paddlers, but this was an emergency. Thus a woman by the name of Wairaka shouted to the gods, Let me make myself, let me make myself into a man. With that, she grabbed the oars and raw, rowed the canoe to safety. I shall do the same, Erinora said to herself, and I shall call myself Eru Era. Hob shy liquor, vo eilst 
duhina ki a fakatane oia ho. Well, thank you very much for that, Witty, and that's just about our time for today. So, um, thank you all for, for coming. Thank you for being here. Nareira. Inga rangatira ma, ka nui te honore ko ho mai ki ai. Ka pine a ko e a uki te pine o te aroha ki te pine e kore nei wai kura e. Nā reira, tēnā koutou katoa.